We're not playing the quiet game on purpose. We're just waiting for, they're going to live stream this. We're waiting for it to come up. He's getting our own life. Switched over from the last meeting. So, and there we are. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming in. Sorry we are a little late. Uh, our park board ran a little over, but we're good. Um, probably because you're here, you've seen that this is a public meeting to uh, go over the design for Ruby Grant Park. It's our next latest, greatest community park. We're really excited about it. Um, I am not Jeff Foster, who's our park director. I'm James Briggs. I'm a project manager for Parks Rank. I'm a landscape architect. Um, I'm working closely with Jeff as we work on this. I don't know how many of you have the long-term memory uh, of this project, but we started it. We had a very long, detailed public input process, developed a plan for Ruby Grant Park. We finally got funding from uh, Norman Forward to build it. And it is a large plan. We are building phase one with this part of uh, Ruby with uh, Norman Forward funding. So we have our um, design team who worked us all the way from the original design from Hal and Mancuren are here. Some of their team members from their uh, engineering and architecture uh, partners for this project. And uh, particularly uh, uh, Nick and Victoria are gonna help us with the playground component, large uh, inclusive playground component. I'm not gonna give anything away when we get into the presentation. But I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, we are live streaming, so anyone watching online uh, can see this as well. But I'm going to introduce Joe Howell as our uh, lead for the from Howell and Mancuren to talk about Ruby Grant Park. And afterwards, we'll have a little Q&A or comments, and I can pass the mic around. But I'm going to leave it up to Joe. Okay. Thank you, James. It's good to see everybody here this evening. And what we'd like to do is go through uh, the history of the master planning and where the design process is today. And then we want to touch a little bit uh, specifically on the inclusive playground because that's an interesting aspect that we've gotten an early start on, at least preliminary, and we'll be talking about other inclusive components of the park. But that's been one of our goals is to really focus on that. This first slide is just intended to remind you of where it is, and you're probably well aware of that, Franklin and 36th uh, in the west part of the city. Now this is an aerial view that shows a couple of streams and water features uh, that are on the property. Just to give you an idea of the character, if you haven't really seen a lot of the site, this is one that's highly visible from the street. This is up in the northwest corner. It's nice. There are many flat areas on the site, which is good for certain kinds of recreational use, but there's also some beautiful natural areas, and one of our goals is to preserve that uh, to the greatest extent that we can. This is a photograph, actually we were out marking the trails. There's an extensive system of trails, uh, both a walkway that's concrete and also a cross country trail that go through the property. And I'll show you more detail uh, about the location of that here in just a moment. But we're locating those items here. It was earlier this year. But there are beautiful wildflowers out there, a lot of nice meadows that you just don't see everywhere anymore because most of those have either been farmed or uh, just simply have been built over. There's also water features on the site. Uh, there's a whole beaver town. This is back, this is actually taken 10 years ago when we were doing the master planning. Uh, we were out there recently and it, it was even more clear then because we'd had, I guess not as much rain, but it was really a lot of the trees that you see here that have died have actually been cut down by the beaver since, so it's a little bit more open. But we have a lot of wildlife out there. There are deer and beavers and rabbits and lots of things. This is a high point of the site, and we'll show you a possibility for what could go there. This is overlooking I-35. This is as you, looking north on I-35. This is a real visible location from I-35. This is a part of the site that's up in the northeast corner, very heavily wooded, mostly small trees, heavily shaded, but it's a wet environment. Uh, but it, it has an interesting aspect to it. So we want to provide access to some of these different types of parts of the site, different areas. This is what's left of the original homestead. This is the barn, obviously not in really good condition. We can't really restore that. And we certainly can't restore the house, Ruby Grant's home, uh, because that's where what it is. And it's, it's about that way today. But we are planning a memorial near that location 
uh, because she had donated this land many years ago to the University of Oklahoma and it's changed hands to the city. So we're going to commemorate that. And then she's a really neat lady. So we want to make special note of that. Uh, during the master planning process, there were different ways that we got input. We got input from public meetings like this, and then we did a scientific survey where it was actually mailed out. And I think we got about an eight or 10% response rate, which is considered pretty good in those things and very accurate. And these were above 60%. These were the most highly thought of components from a wide, wide range of, of things. What actually, this is the, the web survey, I mean the mail out. This is the web survey. It's not considered as accurate because people can vote many times, but it really showed the same same type of result. And you can see most of the things there are passive in nature. That was one of the things that came out of the master planning process. I think the most strong part of the master planning process, no highly developed sports fields with lighting. And so that's not included in this. And when I, I mentioned the word, and we had a couple of work sessions this afternoon, I mentioned the word passive, and we do have, you can run at the park, and we're going to have the cross-country track, and we're going to have the walkway, and we're going to have some unlighted practice fields for just informal play. So it's not completely passive, but it's focused toward maintaining a lesser intensive use. And so those were some of the things, the general conclusions that came from it. Restrooms ranked high on everyone, and we've included restrooms and tree planting, although there are a lot of trees out there. We want to uh, even further enhance that. This was the from the original master plan, and the items noted in red are what was at that time selected to be in the first phase. And as it turns out, that's pretty much what we've stuck with. This is, I think, next is the current plan. And the dark line that you see on that, let me just kind of go over that real quickly, and then I'll get into some more detail of some of the specific components of it. Uh, but the dark line you see there is the walking path that goes, try to point that out. This goes around the site, connects different parts of the site. About 2.5 miles of eight foot wide concrete walking path. Then the lighter gray, and some of it you can't see as well because it coincides with the walking route. That's the lighter gray. And there's a 5K course, and there's a 4K course built into the cross country. And then you see these areas that are highlighted at the north, at the southeast, and the southwest. Those are more intensive developments. There's parking and a pavilion and a restroom and a couple of those, and we'll look at those in more detail here in just a second. But those are the primary intensive development, more intensive development areas of the park. And then in this northwest corner, is an area that this would be kept mowed and these would be uh, for practice fields. So that's the overview of the park. And one thing, one of the major components is a walking path and the cross country. And you can see this is the route of the 5K and the, the cross country track will be 15 foot width of mowed grass. So it's not paved or anything like that. It's just mowed grass. And then this is the 4K loop, and we've been consulting with Scott Monard, who's the uh, cross-country coach for Norman Public Schools. He's helped us out with this, and, and the high schools will be using this, and there will be a few uh, meets that occur here, but it's a really great setting for that because it's got gentle topography, flat areas, trees you'll be running through, so it's beautiful, but it'll also be for people that just want to go out on a daily basis and run on the track because everybody can use it. So we think it's going to be a nice component for the park. One of the, And that was one of the things we talked about this afternoon in our sessions. And another thing was disc golf. That's, that's a very popular and non-intrusive sport. And there's obviously interaction between these different sports. And that's one thing that we're trying to take into account. This would be the, the hatched area that you see in this area. The disc golf course would occur here. And we're going to work with the local organizations to find out the best layout for that. Then zooming in a little closely, this is the north area that we had taught on that large map, those areas that were highlighted. And this would be the location of the Ruby, uh, the Ruby Grant Memorial. And it's also doubled as a picnic shelter. 
And then we've got about 80 parking spaces. In the future, there will be a restroom at this location. And then you can see the walking trails. And then this, this happens to be the route of the cross country track that goes as it passes through that area. Then moving over to the southeast corner, this is developed as the area that I'm encircling here. That's a dog park. And we're trying to incorporate the latest and greatest components of the dog park. That's become an increasingly popular. Uh, it's amazing to me that the number of people that use dog parks, and this is a, something really needed in Norman. Uh, then we'd have 50 parking spaces here. Uh, and then a restroom at this location. This is a beautiful setting over here. So it's a, and we would leave parts of it in a natural condition. Then at the southwest corner is another 80 car parking lot. And you can see the walkway system that goes from here. This is actually the starting point of the cross country track at this location. And then a, a really a neat playground that we're still working on. And Nick Wizenai is going to come up in just a moment when I'm finished and kind of run through some of the principles that are going, they're being uh, used in development of that playground. And by the way, I'm going to get through this as quick as I can, but and so we want to hear from you all too. I forgot to mention that, not just to hear us. And then at this location, we also have a, a uh, restroom location right there. And then a, a nice large picnic pavilion, possibly a future splash pad in this location also. And then there are several key structures, and we want to keep these as natural as we could, but have them very substantial and attractive components of the park. Uh, one would be the Ruby Grant Memorial. I have an enlarged view of that in just a moment. It's up at the north end. Uh, over on the west side, we have a restroom and then a large picnic pavilion. And then again, a, a restroom over at the dog park area. This is an enlargement of that Ruby Grant Memorial, and you can see in the center, uh, would be just information about Ruby Grant. I think you all can see that. I can't find my pointer right there. And then on the back side of this is actually right now, this is uh, uh, a fireplace on the back side. And we have yet to figure out the details of that. We're thinking it's an electronic fireplace, not gas, wood burning. Not as nice as <laughs> wood, but we don't. If we just turned it loose in terms of wood burning, it might get out of control. So right now we're looking at that because there would be a certain ambience even to that. And this is a larger picnic pavilion and it also in the center, and we think this is a good thing. It does, it, it divides it to a certain extent, but you can work around it. And it would have a fireplace that would extend all the way through. But if you had a smaller group on one end, you could have another group on the other end. So it would kind of serve as dual purpose or you could you, rent the whole or reserve the whole thing. So that would be at the Southwest corner. This is the restroom. The two restrooms would look like this, one at the southwest corner and one over by the dog park. And then we've taken special care to make sure that these serve everybody's needs. We've got a family room in the center that you can see right in here. We have changing tables out in the main. We have handicapped, complete accessibility. And so this will continue to be tweaked, but we feel really good about what we have at this point developed on the restrooms. And then for signage, one of the things that we're considering right now is a large Welcome to Norman sign on that high spot that you saw in that photograph. This would be highly visible from coming in on I-35 from the north. This would be lighted. This is one of the few signs that would probably be lighted, but that would be quite a, a, a nice entry feature for Norman and also an icon for the park. And then the uh, park entries are the main park sign, excuse me, at the northwest corner. So it'd be 36 in Franklin, right at that, and maybe at a 45 degree angle. So it's highly visible from, that would be the main park sign. And then at each one of the parking lot entries would be a smaller sign about Ruby Grant and telling you what is at that location. This is a, a bigger view of that, what that large sign could look like. And again, it would be lighted from the ground. This would might not be lighted. We have yet to, to make that determination, but you can kind of see the architectural character being carried forward into the signage component. And we're trying to keep with that natural theme. And I'm real happy so far. We're real happy with how the design on these is working. And then carrying a little bit further on signage, this is uh, a wayfinding sign. So when you come into the parking lot, 
you can see where you are. This is 150 acres, so it's really good to have some directional information. And we've even talked about making that for sight impaired people that so we have some kind of braille information or tactile type sign. Uh, Jack had mentioned that today, and I think that's an excellent idea. Uh, we want to be sure and incorporate that. And then at the intersections, if you remember, the, there are a lot of trails out there. So it'll be important, especially for the first time users to know when they get to an intersection, well, which way do I go and what is in that location. And so these ones in the middle would serve that purpose. And then we have what might be a marker, a 5K, or, or it would mark the kilometers on the uh, cross-country track. <coughs> and so that's a quick overview of the type of improvements that we would anticipate for the park. And so before we get into open discussion, I just want Nick to come up here real quickly and run through some of the principles of the playground. And, and we're going to be talking about other things that involve making the park more widely usable by the community. But the playground is one thing that we've done a little bit of thinking about. So I wanted to be sure that we talked about that specifically. And as soon as they're through, I'll come back up and we'll just start fielding questions and, and try to answer any questions that you have and, and go from there. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Victoria. I work with Nick. I'm uh, the, the part of Cunningham that helps raise philanthropic dollars. So we're not going to talk about that tonight. But I wanted to ask just if you would share the value of play. So there's so many times we get in front of people and we talk about playgrounds and they think, oh, it's this great place to keep kids busy. And they don't really know the value of play. So I just kind of want to start the conversation. When we are discussing a playground, what, what comes to your mind in terms of benefits? That's okay. You like slides? You like slides? Yeah. What about climbing trees? Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. So, well, we will have that for sure. We'll have that soft servicing. So, there's a lot of physical benefits. Obviously, you know, kids sit in front of screens for an average of seven to eight hours a day now. And so, getting kids outside is a big benefit in stretching their muscles and imaginations. Um, the other thing is economic impact. When we bring a destination playground to a community, people come from all over. And so they come and they, they shop and they fill up with gas and they go buy a restaurant. So it brings a lot of great commerce. The other thing is developmental. It helps kiddos with physical development and sensory communication um, and social emotional. So that's a huge benefit. And the other part that's really near and dear to my heart and inspired me to become what people often refer to as a playground lady is uh, the social cohesion part. The part about bringing people from various backgrounds and children who look differently together. And so they can form those bonds and create a greater understanding. And so what you're doing here by bringing a, an inclusive playground is, is very, very beneficial for, you know, this generation and then the next generation as well. So Nick's going to tell you a little bit more about the technical aspects of what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nick Wisenhunt. I'm with Cunningham Recreation. Uh, we represent Game Time Playgrounds. I'm not going to be showing you a playground design tonight. What I'm really here to do is get your feedback, walk through the methodology of how we go about designing an inclusive space. And I'm not just talking about the playground, but kind of piggybacking on what Victoria said is the cohesion. Um, how does this playground work into the rest of the space? Uh, please, at any point during this, if you have questions, I want to keep this interactive. Just raise your hand. Don't feel the need to wait till the end. So our inclusion philosophy. So the parent company of Game Time is PlayCore. They are unmatched in our industry in terms of third-party research. They pump a lot of research dollars into the industry. Um, we get a lot of uh, product development bleeds down through that. Uh, we develop a lot of best practices, design guides. Um, and one of the things we came up with were the seven principles of inclusive design, which we're going to utilize to actually design this space. So our inclusion philosophy obviously starts with uh, Department of Justice standards for ADA. It has to. Then we integrate our seven principles of inclusive design. And the third part of that is the programming. 
We really want to create champions within your community. We really want community input on the design. We want, uh, we want this to get, again, be a destination that people come from other communities to come and see. Uh, we want champions out there talking about how great your city is and how great this space is gonna be. So I like this slide. Um, I'm very visual, and this is a very visual, very good visual representation of what we, de we deem inclusive. So on the far left, you can see exclusion. It's kind of scattered around the outside. Segregation, now it's a little more centralized. Integration, we're bringing that into the play area. And true inclusion is, regardless of your age or ability, you can use this space. And that's, that's the goal when we're doing an inclusive space. So our philosophy, again, is to address the whole child, the whole environment, and the entire community when we're doing one of these spaces. I also like this graph as well. Um, we've come a long way as an industry and as a company in the last 10 or 15 years on our understanding and our application of inclusion. Um, as you can see here, out of 1,000 adults, 85 will have um, a disability. One will be physical, which obviously access is important, um, but what really jumps out at me is this largest segment, largest segment of cognitive disabilities. So again, that comes back to the whole child. Um, and not just the child, but the adult, the caregiver that's bringing the child to the play space. So that's where we've come and that's where we've advanced to as, a, as an industry is, is really understanding a better understanding of inclusion. We're still learning. I'm still learning. Um, and that's why when I'm designing one of these, I really do want to get the feedback from the community. I want to hear what you guys need. So seven principles of inclusive design that came from a partnership with Utah State and their Center for uh, People with Disabilities. They helped us design these, principle, uh, design these principles specifically for the play space. So I'm just gonna walk through our seven principles and how they specifically apply to the playground space. So be fair is our first principle, equitable use, opportunities for multiple types of development, multi-generational, I think that's key when you're doing an inclusive space. Um, I'm very lucky in that I do this for a living. I spend most of my time on playgrounds observing, but I also spend a lot of time playing. Um, we don't want to make passive environments. We want to make environments where if you bring a child or a grandchild uh, to a play space, you get to interact, you get to play. I think it's very healthy. I think it's important for adults to play through their whole life. So in multi-generational space, it's going to be a big, a big focus of this design. Um, we also did quite a bit of research on Ruby Grant and learned some interesting things about her uh, tutoring of reading and music. And I think that's going to be a pretty natural theme for this play space if we play it right. That's where I'm gonna ask for some feedback. Um, how far do we go with that theme? Do we go with that theme? Do we go with a different theme? These are all things that we're gonna to have to figure out. And uh, we had a meeting about it earlier today. I think we've got a, a pretty good steering committee, but the more feedback, the better, because uh, I really do want some direction. Uh, I think a, a shaded reading area would be a really nice piece for this environment. Um, I think music is a must. Um, on any inclusive space because it's just so multi-generational as I, as I talked about earlier. Um, Co-op play, um, the expression swing here, that's probably one of our most popular developments in the last 20 years is this, I mean, a lot of people call it the mommy and me swing. I've yet to put that in a park that didn't have a line. I mean, this, this, this is a big development. Um, the attunement that you get from the caregiver to the child that's swinging in it, attunement being the eye contact they make, it's a pretty special thing uh, when you witness it. Be included. So flexibility and use, uh, multiple types and forms of play, graduated levels of challenge, I think is extremely important. Um, we want children to be able to go to the same play space and continue to develop physically, mentally, social, emotionally, socially, emotionally. Um, so that graduated level of challenge is really important. Gross and fine motor. That's a given. We have to have those. Um, usable by the uh, most people to the greatest extent. That's a really good microcosm of inclusion right there. Um, regardless of age or ability, I'm going to keep saying that, but that's our inclusion philosophy. You can use this space regardless of age or ability. So this dual zip track, um, can't really see it, but it's got a high molded back seat, which is an inclusive seat on one side and a more challenging, more of a standard zip, zip line type seat on the other side. Um, we pretty much use that on every design, uh, inclusive design that we do. It's extremely popular. It takes up a ton of space. 
Um, so those are the kind of decisions I'm gonna I'm gonna look to the community. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna between Victoria and I, we're gonna come up with a with some ideas of how do we best quantify and qualify these individual pieces. Like how how interested is the community in having a piece like this, provided it, it takes up so much space. So um, this art swing in the bottom right, extremely inclusive piece, very wide age range can uh, support a number of, of physical disabilities. Um, this parallel play right here, I think this is just a great snapshot of inclusion right here, this parallel play, equitable use. These are terms that I've had pounded into my brain and I'm glad I did, because um, when we're designing these spaces, equitable use is, is uh, always a key component as well. Be smart, simple, intuitive, behavioral cues, sensory feedback, Looping play patterns. When I say looping play patterns, I mean if there is a, a ramp access or a transfer station, if a child or an adult is in a mobility device and they transfer out of that mobility device to access something in an elevated platform, what is the most direct route back to that mobility device? Looping play patterns also mean um, children, regardless of age or ability, tend to loop and do the same components over and over again. So how are we promoting that? How are we giving visual cues like you see here in the rubber? Um, that's, a, that's a really good use of the, of the rubber as an actual play element and a visual cue. Um, you know, being cognizant of, of usable space and maneuverability, wide ramps, um, so that a, a child in a mobility device could pass another child, either able-bodied or in another mobility device at the same time. It's, it's celebrating differences. It's not focusing on them in a negative light. So these are the kind of things we, we think about. There's educational opportunities with educational signage, um, theming opportunities that, that kind of promote education. I really like this piece. Victoria and I were talking about this. Um, from the educational standpoint, the aesthetics are nice and it does not create a sight line issue because of this opening right here. So these are all little things that uh, we try to consider and we really do, again, look for the feedback when we go to actually design this. Uh, be independent, perceptible info, accessible routes through ADA compliant surfaces, as the young man just pointed out a minute ago, uh, sensory rich, and uh, encourage exploration. So we're, we're trying to create a space that promotes independence um, so that uh, a caregiver or a parent could find a shaded seating area and watch their child have fun. They don't have to monitor it more than just sitting there and watching them play and have fun. So that's the kind of space we're trying to uh, create. It has its challenges, um, but if enough thought is put into it, it, it can be done. I've done it many times. So again, kind of like the last slide, how are we going to use this rubber? Are we going to use it, as you see here, um, where we are actually sec uh, separating uh, the age groups? Are we going to use it as an actual play component here? As you can see the zip line going over what seems to be a, a river bridge here. Um, are we going to have bike racks, themed bike racks? I think that kind of goes along with the reading and the musical theme. Um, this is a project we did in Mustang. You know, we just did these little, just just the littlest thing can, can really drive home the theme and the experience of a play, of a play space. You know, these directional cues, um, you know, cornstalk climbers this way, play this way. Uh, be safe. Tolerance for error age appropriate, obviously, um, addressing potential hazards. Um, when we create these inclusive space, we have uh, significant and special challenges that we have to consider. Um, one being barriers. I know Jack and I talked about this and everybody else did in the meeting earlier today. That'll be a big consideration. How do we, how do we fence it in? And if we fence it in, do we also include landscaping? Um, That'll be a big consideration. I'll, I'll, I'll again look to uh, the, the community for some feedback there. Um, you know, sim things as simple as a buddy bench. I think most people are aware of what a buddy bench is, but, you know, it's the concept of, again, social inclusion. Um, uh, in a queue that there's a, there's, a, there's a peer sitting on this bench that doesn't have anybody to play with, I'm going to go engage with them and get them using the play space. Just a very simple concept. Um, this again is a picture from Mustang. You know, uh, this is a challenge and this is a, a tolerance for air. So it's kind of a dark picture up there, but we have all these elevated entrances. Well, that's a good foot and a half to two feet drop right there. So we have to consider that. We have to put in some railing. 
Um, again, that's just a tolerance for error that we have to think about. Um, this is a project we did at Turtle Splash Park in the Chicago Metro. Uh, you can't see it, but they actually have fencing around here, but they utilized a lot of landscaping um, as a visual barrier as well. So you can do fencing, you can make it safe, you can make it, um, uh, again, a safe environment and, and still have it aesthetically pleasing as we've done here. Be active. Um, high backs and molded seats as we talked about um, for the zip track. That's the seat that would be on the zip track. Um, maintain that neutral body position. Equitable use options. Um, again, I love this picture because that's multi-generational right there. I've been on one of these merry-go-walls many times. It's a lot of fun. Um, these whorls are actually flush with the rubber. This is something that's come in the industry in, in about the last year and a half that we're really excited about. We've done a couple of these projects. Again, a simple idea that somebody thought of that, frankly, somebody should have thought of 10 years ago and never did. So now we're starting to see these in a lot of our projects. Um, I really like this picture here as well. This is an interactive play piece up here in the top right. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the nuts and bolts of this piece specifically, but it's an interactive piece. Um, you can dance. There's different games to play on it. And they've actually created almost a performance area here. So I think that's a, that's a cool way to, again, provide that comfort for a caregiver or a parent. They can actually observe play. Um, this will, you know, encourage imaginative play, performance, the supervision area. It could be a jump-in point. Um, a cozy spot to acclimate yourself before joining your peers on the play space. So a lot of uh, versatility with a, a setup like that. Be comfortable. Size and space for approach and use. Crow's next activities, wide ramps again, very important. Deck clusters, and when I, say, when I mean by deck clusters, these large spaces right here. Maneuverable space is just huge when you're doing an inclusive playground. Uh, again, that, that kind of hits all the seven principles. You know, be comfortable, be safe. Um, encourage exploration. When you provide the usable space and you do it correctly and you promote those looping play patterns, um, children appreciate it. They may not even notice, um, but it's, it's, it's just a, it's a, a small design element that we always make sure to uh, focus on. Shade is going to be huge um, because of uh, some of the adverse effects that certain medications have. Um, and obviously just making it a comfortable space that uh, a family can spend a weekend at. Um, front reach versus side reach, you know, as we see here with this, uh, these musical elements, very important for, for just general comfort. So it's the, it's the little design elements that, that really will make this space a success. So this is a tool. I wish I had enough of these to hand out. I hand them all out at the other meeting, but this is a, a great tool that we utilize every time we do an inclusive play space. So it, it points out the five areas of development, cognitive, sensory, social, emotional, physical, um, how a, a, a dramatic play activity or sand and water table, which of those five categories will it, will it help development? And you can't see it here, but it'll also, um, it, it will uh, also relate to this one of the seven principles as well. So this is, this is just a, an example of play core developing a metric and a scientific approach to inclusion, which I really appreciate um, because oftentimes in our industry think terms like play value or inclusion, they're very broad terms and no one really defines them. And Playcore does a great job of actually defining them and showing you a scientific method by which you can attain inclusion. So this is kind of the interactive portion that I really would like some feedback. Um, when I'm going through the design process, these are some of the things I ask. So if we're going to go with a theme, how much direction do we provide to make uh, in the make-believe process? And, and by that, I mean, do we do this on the left where it's dinosaurs tearing apart the playground? Or do we do it on the right where it's a tree and it kind of leaves it up to the child to determine, you know, are they, um, are they um, swinging through the jungles? Are they walking across a prairie? So how much direction? And it seems odd, but that really is a, a big consideration when you're talking about designing a play space is if you're going to go with a theme, how much theming do we actually go with? Or do we do a very traditional, I would say these are all pretty natural themes. A lot of these are custom. You know, this tree here, this is made out of concrete. The dinosaur is made out of concrete. These are all custom designs. We could literally draw something on a piece of paper here tonight and create it. Now that, uh, what comes with that are 
uh, heightened install cost, cost of materials go well up. We can also do a natural theme with very standard products. I think this is a very natural theme as well. The difference being this is a plastic rock. This is a plastic tree. So those are the kinds of absolutes I always ask for when I'm designing a playground is, okay, if we were gonna do a natural theme, is it a concrete tree or a concrete dinosaur? Or is it a plastic tree and a plastic rock? Because those will really drive the design. Uh, whimsical, does it stand out versus natural blend in? So. This is a project Victoria actually worked on in Missouri where we actually created an, an accessible volcano in Herculaneum. Um, to me, that stands out. It's a volcano in the middle of a field. There's no other volcanoes around it. Now this, if you could see it in context, this is a lighthouse, but it's right near the beach. Um, it is a very large custom piece, but it really blends into the background. Um, so that's what I mean by are we having pieces that stand out or are we going to have pieces that blend in? Uh, Multi-generational fitness. I think this would be a very good addition to this play space. But there's a lot of decisions with that as well. Are we going functional fitness, as we see here on the left, with Thrive? Are we going low-impact fitness, as we see up here in the top right? Are we going more traditional fitness? Are we going to go static? Are we going to have stuff that moves and uses your own body weight? Where are we going to put it? Are we going to put it right here in the middle and almost utilize it? As a, as a place to actually uh, observe play and monitor play. So the layout of fitness is a big consideration. If we're going to do it at all, where are we going to put it? How does it work well in the space? Because it's all got to flow. Um, when we're creating these spaces, I, I, I try not to use the word playground because when we're creating an inclusive space, um, adjacent amenities are important. Um, the space we're provided is going to tell us how we need to lay out to a point. So a lot of considerations. Fencing, again, so there's a couple schools of thought on this. So on the left here, it's an inclusive space we did in Missouri. We did fencing, just standard fencing all the way around it. It does its job. It's very functional. This is another shot of that turtle splash playground we talked about earlier. A lot of landscaping. So not necessarily a barrier, but a visual cue that this is the play space, this is not. Um, and then we actually threw a trampoline in there as well, which is a lot of fun. So again, Barriers are a big consideration. I think we probably do need to do some form of barrier, and I think probably fencing um, with some landscaping, as, as Jack and I were talking about earlier, would probably be the way to go. And finally, what works and what doesn't? What do you like and what don't you like? As many of these as I've, as I've designed over the last 10 years, that is a question I always ask. Because if you guys don't like tube slides, I'm not gonna put any tube slides on it. If it's a visual, if it's a, it's a, a sight line issue, um, if you don't like um, panels with batteries in them. So these are things to consider. As, as important as it is um, with regard to what you like, it's equally as important to me about what you don't like because this is going to be your space. This is your community. So I want to do um, what's going to work best. Real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Just real quick, when Nick mentioned fencing, I, I just kind of wanted to bring your attention to why uh, many parents have asked us to provide a fence. For one, it's just an extra layer of safety for any child who gets excited and they tend to run. But for some families who have children uh, that are on the spectrum with autism, they do tend to run and, and uh, seek different cues differently. So they may become overwhelmed or overstimulated, and then they may want to run away. And so that extra layer of fence is so important for families like that. But um, so the question is, you know, do we fence it up, fence it up? And if so, are there gates on there? You know, is it is it a fence or is it a natural barrier? And, and so it's something, as Nick said, to take in consideration, but there's a real value to a fence just to have that extra layer of safety. Over the next uh, few weeks and months, we're going to really drill down to um, what we want to see on this playground. And I'm, I welcome any feedback anybody can give. If you want to be part of a steering committee, I, I'm not sure what we're going to end up forming, but it's going to be driven by the community. And I really hope we get a lot of uh, feedback and direction. And I'm, I'm willing to uh, offer my opinions. I've done a lot of these. But again, I keep saying this at the end of the day, it's your community, it's your park. Um, it's important to everybody, but it's especially important to the community that it's in. So um, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to anybody after this. I'd be happy to fill questions now. Um, are there any questions about the design of the play space? Have you done any of the other park playgrounds in Norman? 
not specifically in Norman. I've got quite a few in the Oklahoma City metro. Um, I'm actually the regional manager for our company. I live and work in Oklahoma. I'm actually an OU alum as well. I'm just going to throw that in there. Um, uh, I've not done – actually, we did Eastwood. Eastwood. That's yeah. true. We did Eastwood, and we did the fitness equipment out at, the, exactly. out at Saxon. Mustangs are big. Mustang. I've got a lot of large, inclusive uh, projects right here in the metro, quite a few in Tulsa as well. Um, and our company, uh, we're based out of Charlotte. That's where our corporate offices are. Um, I would venture a guess we've done more inclusive jobs than any company, in, definitely in the U.S., possibly in the world. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'll let Joe kind of field some of those questions. I know adjacent amenities are a definite consideration we're doing in inclusive space. Where are the bathrooms? Where, how, how far from the parking lot do you have to go until you get to the playground? So that's, that's uh, I'll let Joe field that question. But that's definitely going to be a consideration in terms of fitness. Um, that's actually uh, where that industry is going as well. And it's exactly what you're talking about. We have a lot of wayfinder signs. Um, we have small fitness pockets. Um, and the first, the welcome sign or the first kind of play pocket or fitness pocket that you hit is just what you're talking about. It's static, it's made for stretching, and it's supposed to be progressively harder as you go through it. So the next one might be um, a chin up or a, or a, a seated leg press. And so there, there is some science behind that. And I think that'd be a good thing to consider and a, and, and a good thing to possibly um, include in the, in the space. Just to respond real quickly to the circulation, pedestrian circulation, we've tried to, and we have a, we don't have it up on the screen anymore, but we have a drawing over here and we'd be glad to go over in more detail, but we've really taken care to keep the automobile and pedestrian separated. And so once you get away from the parking lot, there's no more conflict and the parking lots are at the far edges. So there's no internal roadways to ever have to cross so once you get into the park away from the parking lot it's going to be a really pleasant environment is that kind of addressing what you're saying well it's connected by a jogging trail that comes in from the south side and it'll tie into that and and that's the only one right now that 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 links up but in the future, if there are others that it, it's designed with that perimeter walk and we are linking in at the southwest corner. You have to cross 36 to get over to it. So yeah. I'm not sure what the plan for 36, if there is going to be a lit intersection at the half mile point, but you know, you'll, you'll, have to, you'll have to cross 36 to get to it. Right. You have to cross yeah, Franklin. So I was thinking of two I think that would be a possibility and it'd be good to try to consider that at this point. I'm not sure if we're supposed to use this, but since we're live streaming, I probably ought to use this mic for people because they can't see everything. So I'm going to throw a question out. This may be outside the scope of the park, but I, I have talked to Scott Sturtz about this, the city engineer about this very issue, wondering if there's a best practice to maybe design the intersection of Franklin Road and 36th 
to where the lanes get narrower mm -hmm. so that people naturally slow down because there are, there are a lot of families who are going to be crossing both at the half mile there near All Saints coming in at the south end of the park. And I don't know how to do it, but if you guys have seen it successfully done in other locations where you take ma a major section line road like that and, and somehow calm traffic down, huh? He didn't have any great ideas. We talked about a roundabout. He said maybe a roundabout would work at Franklin and 36. And I'm thinking cars never stop at a roundabout. I don't <laughs> know if that's, that might be a brilliant idea, but we, if you have some adult supervision on this, we could probably use it. <laughs> I've never seen a slam dunk solution to that problem. It is always now in city streets downtown, they narrow them down because you have parking on both sides. And so you can narrow the street, but when you're out and you have two lanes or four lanes, especially if you have two lanes, and I don't know if the, the road when it's wide is going to have four or not, but it's really hard to, to take one of those lanes away. It's a little bit of a challenge. So, uh, a light is the best solution, uh, and that's not a panacea by any means. But the other thing might be one of those. Uh, you want me to talk to the microphone again? You know, over by uh, University of Oklahoma near the Catlett parking garage, they've got these pedestrian sensors that light up. And oh, yeah. Walk out there, and that could be kind of cool. That would be a good thing. Yes. You know, mother with small. Because children. you need a long. Because there's cars that speed along there, and it'll probably get even worse. And the sight lines are not that great anyway. So I think it would really benefit from that. That's for sure. So right now the entrances are going to be at 36 and flood. That'll be a parking lot main entrance there. And then there's going to be another entrance, I guess, closer to all saints. No, or, I mean, 36 and Franklin, 36 and Franklin. That'll be a main entrance. No, the really the entrances are, at the halfway point in between Franklin and whatever road is south of that at the halfway, that's at the southwest corner of the property. And then there's one on Franklin that's about, it's about the midpoint across the whole property. And then there's one that kind of reflects the one on the southwest over by the car dealership on the frontage road on the southeast corner. So there isn't anything at that major intersection 36th and Franklin other than a sign and I think that's good because that area is uh, and it will continue to be a pretty high traffic intersection so if we, we pull the entries to the park back away from that is there going to be an entrance when you're going down 36 no going north and you turn left you're going to Carrington place is that going to be an entrance like if you were to turn right are they going to put a road where you can go into Ruby Grant Park? That's not the way we have it set up right now. It, it's not across from another entry. It's it's independent, and and we have to get into traffic engineering, but it's my understanding sometimes it depends on the situation. That's better than, than having a T intersection. I mean, having a, a complete cross intersection. I live in Carrington. He lives in Carrington. I think the best place would be a crosswalk right there at the entrance of Carrington Place to go across the street into Ruby Grant. Is that a possibility? Is that? Compound the number of ways to have an accident by is that a more? magnitude okay. of four-way intersections. So a freeway is like 16 times safer than a four-way <coughs> Are you guys working close together with the Carrington properties and everything? Okay. Traffic engineering books talk about this stuff. But we'd be happy to Okay. Good. What about an entrance over there close to All Saints? My kids go to All Saints. I assume that the All Saints kids would love to use the park for activities. Is there going to be any entrance close to All Saints to the park? On 36, the, the, oh, 36. the Lexi Trail, for lack of a better term, the wide sidewalk along 36 will take right into the park from All Saints. I don't know if it's going to be up to All Saints as a neighbor to decide whether we want to have an opening. Along because we share the fence right there on the south on the north side of all Saints that is that is the property line in between. So if there's a desire to connect into the park from there, we could work on on that as a sort of a secondary. But yeah, you'll absolutely come from right on 36 and walk right in there. I think they'd be a good person to have on the steering committee, someone from All Saints, since there's a school right next to Ruby Grant. And so and there's Very also good. 
There's also a sidewalk in front of All Saints that has collapsed over the years. Yeah. And, and I, we walk our kids across the street at All Saints, and they said they aren't going to fix it until they start construction on Ruby Grant Park and the roadway. So we, we're concerned like they're ever going to fix that, that sidewalk. Right. The, uh, 36 is a project separate from Ruby Grant. Okay. I, think I think what they were telling you is they're going to do it when they fly 36, because Ruby Grant only exists north of All yeah. Saints. So all the funding for this happens at Ruby Grant Park, but I think the sidewalk improvement will come when they widen 36. Yes. Any any other comments? Question. Yes. Is there a potential in the playground area that like the natural topography of the area would be included in creating some of the play structures? So if it's a hill that has a slide built in or a I've been in Northwest Arkansas and seen some playgrounds. I mean, it's a pretty and hilly area, yeah. so there's some natural. Now, in that particular location, we don't have any topography, but we're thinking about creating some uh, because we'd like to gain some elevation just to make the inclusive playground work better. It's easier to gain height gradually over a long distance. And I definitely think we could work in some topography to have features like that. It'd be kind of a more natural naturalistic type setting and that that'd be certainly possible something we will look at i guess the second thing would be tying in with like the school location to all saints but also all of norman schools the idea of an outdoor classroom um somewhere in the park where there would be a space for and if that's a not even necessarily an amphitheater type situation but just a just real informal and that would be an excellent way to if, easy that's a really large piece of land i think about we live in central norman so my kid going out to the country of, of Northwest Norman, it could feel like a field trip type experience. That's a really good idea. And we have the, the parking lot on the north and the parking lot on the east are fairly close by some really pretty areas. The parking lot on the other corner, you'd have to walk about a half a mile to get somewhere you'd want to really have an outdoor classroom. But those other two could really be nice. Not to say you couldn't walk from there, but those other two are really close to some natural really nice uh, I mean, areas. Natural materials, I mean, the, the rock that you're using in the signage, I mean. Yeah, you could have mean, boulders to sit Disney on. Adventures or California Adventures in Disneyland, but that really pretty. Yeah, kind of I think thing. that's a really good idea. What's your question? Okay. Um, okay, there left me off. Yeah. Um, okay, um, can you tell us? He likes twisty slides. Okay. So that would we be maybe it. in that tube world of slides. Okay. Um, okay thank so yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We can do that. Nice. Good job. Hey, uh, we might remind that there's a phase two of Ruby Grant, also where we talked about like display gardens and that kind of stuff, more interpretive signage, more things talking about the the natural, more outdoor classroom stuff. That that is in the master plan, if I recall. Um, it to it have is, but I think even on a small scale, right? We could fit it in this phase. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, but I think yeah. Whatever we start here, probably will get much more uh, detailed and more uh, interpretive, and and more into the sort of teaching component in the next phase too. So be be excited for that too. As in playground equipment or the look of the playground. I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old. And his favorite place to go in Norman is, is Reeves Park because it's huge and big. And there's lots of high structures he can run across. So we love the biggest, grandest, coolest looking equipment that's nice and tall that everybody can see. Because that's what my kid like. He sees it and he wants to go to that. Um, but he also likes the Lions Park um, maze. He really liked the maze there. So there's a big enough place. We like maze playgrounds. Um, and then I keep seeing the gathering place from Tulsa. I don't know how grand you guys want it to be, but if it could be something as grand as that, that, that'd be awesome. Right, we'll work on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, we live right across the street. We play in all the playgrounds in Carrington and Castle Rock. We play in the playground at All Saints. So my kids love just big, grand slides, twisty, everything. But then my two-year-old, she's so small that she wants, we want something safe for younger kids. Yeah, that's so, a challenge, but that's right. what uh, the uh, they'll be working on uh, for the playground to make sure that eight different age groups, different abilities are addressed. 
So I think you'll be really pleased. And this is really just the starting of the playground design. So it's going to go through uh, more scrutiny and more development. Yeah, and I would like to address one thing. We, we will have challenging climbers. Um, this is going to be a truly inclusive environment. So we are going to have, as I mentioned, graduate level challenge. We're going to we, we add nets. We'll definitely have challenging climbers. In terms of height, that'll be a discussion. And again, something I'll look for feedback from. Because you got to consider if we do a 12 foot tall deck, let's say, uh, which is really tall for a playground. If we want to take inclusion to the point that we have ramped access to each deck height, a ramp can only go up one foot for every 12 feet. So just consider that. So we would have to get ramps. And that's a lot of decks, and then we're taking up a lot of space. But there are ways to design around that. The topography you were talking about, that, that Jim was talking about creating, we like to utilize that every time we do an inclusive space. Create the topography that's not there, if it's not there. That way, the first deck height that we're going to after that one foot incline is four feet high instead of one foot. So we, that's definitely something we'll, we'll discuss and look we'll for feedback. Because we know it's going to be a few years before everything gets done. So as my child gets older and he's in middle school or fourth, fifth grade, and we want it to be fun and challenging. And we know the kids at All Saints that goes up to eighth grade. We want, I want those kids to still want to go there when they're in seventh and eighth grade. So something for the young kids all the way up to the older kids. And something just to, we know the northwest side of Norman where this is being built, it's going to be a hard draw to pull in central Norman and other parts of Norman if it's just a, a bland, normal playground you see at any park. So definitely, we, so definitely a, a grand park to pull people all the way to come to the northwest side of Norman since... It's it's it is kind of far from everywhere else in Norman. Any other? Yes. Uh, somebody mentioned fencing. Um, I love the signage, the theme of the, the stone and so forth. But is that going to be carried in? I know the fencing right now is just metal. It's a lot of barbed wire, and that's all going to come down. But we think instead of ringing the whole property with fencing right now, we're thinking about the the board and rail type fence uh, that uh, would kind of blend in with that and maybe have it on both sides of the key entries, and it would maybe extend for 100 or 200 feet so that it identifies where you enter. So it continues with that same theme, uh, but probably won't continue at this point, at least in phase one, all the way around the whole property because that is a long long distance but we do want to clean the edge up completely so that it looks well maintained right now it's overgrown the, the fence and so that will definitely be enhanced improved We're definitely considering putting up an ornamental very nice aesthetically pleasing looking fence around the play space for that extra layer of safety i had one more thing sorry um I do a lot of events with Norman Parks and Rec, um, and we there's tons of like 5K races in Norman, so I'm excited to have an actual 5K area that can be enclosed, so that people can do their 5Ks in Norman and not have to block off so many streets and and impede traffic. Good. So so having an area to do these the 5Ks with the cross country, but even to do like the Norman like 5Ks or like a Brookhaven run, things like that, and having an area with like a finish line and and an area to do all that, maybe bring in some food trucks for these big 5Ks. I don't know if you guys were considering an area like, hey, where you could bring in big events and bring in food trucks and bring in entertainment, or if there is going to be an amphitheater stage to do some of these. Phase events. two, but I mean, there could be a temporary stage brought in if that was desired. And uh, we do have quite a bit of parking there at the southwest corner. And we've tried to increase to a reasonable amount to, that the parking would serve the needs, most needs of the park. And having that cross country for neighborhood use, I think is going to be really big. I'd love to be on a steering committee to help with you guys. So, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, if there's no other questions, as I mentioned, we did bring a drawing that we can talk in more detail. If you want to see where the entries are, we kind of flashed over that in the screen image. But we've got a detailed plan over here that shows those exactly where they are if you want to talk about that specifically. So with that, I guess uh, yeah, there will be um, there will be other public meet there'll be other forums kind of to uh, talk about what's going to come up, particularly that we're focusing a lot on the playground, but that's on purpose. That's a uh, direction we've gotten from, uh, from citizens 
from council, for anyone that we really want to knock the playground out of the park with this one. It's a several hundred thousand dollar budget for this. You know, normal neighborhood playground might be a hundred thousand dollar budget, but it's going to be it's going to be a large and really aiming towards the inclusive uh, aspect. So that's that, and then we'll probably do a similar type project over at Reeves Park as we develop that one. There's a, a there's a space and a call for a, a large inclusive uh, playground area there, but. Just kind of keep an eye out. Like I said, we weren't here to redesign the entire park tonight. Like the design's been on the books for a while, but we are uh, getting through these uh, these questions and kind of keep an eye out. And you'll see other opportunities to come and have some input, particularly as they form. We're going through the Disability Coalition here in town to put together a group of people to really advise us with their populations on uh, on what to include in not just the playground but the park as a whole. And we've had some good input from uh, some local consultants on that. So. Appreciate Helen and Kieran and their team and all of you who came out here tonight, but stay tuned. More to come from Norman Parks at Ruby Grant. Thank you.